Yeah, it didn't work so good though with those guys. Yeah, I was Can we use yours instead or mine? Yeah, I was wondering are we expected to use that? I don't think so. It said you can use it at your PD. Yeah, I'll use my laptop yeah. since I got all the slides too. Uh, I think all I have to do is press this button up a little bit. I don't do it, press this just once and that means all the time. I can just press it again. Okay. Yeah, so welcome to PIM Working Group. Um, we need a minute taker. See Greg stepped out of the room. Um, anyone willing to take minutes? Uh, yeah, we got a pretty full agenda, and we can't start until we get the minute taker. I'll 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 take notes. So we'll to between the two of us. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks. All right. So uh, this is a note bow that you all should be aware of. But this is for all ITF work, not just the Tim Working Group. And this is the agenda. Any comments on the agenda? So um, I'm going to try to order this so that the same speaker more or less can take you all the documents at the same time. Um, the order is fairly random. Um, all right. Yeah, I did try to do the uh, working group documents first, though, roughly speaking. All right. Okay. So this is our status. Um, this last time we published RC8364, which is PIM flooding mechanism. Um, the PIM Yang model is now in the RFC editor's queue, so it's been approved. It's just waiting for the editor to do the final final editing. So in a few weeks now, we should have our first Yang model, which uh, is great. Um, 
and we got yeah, still more models coming. Um, multiple upstream requirements. Um, we agreed to publish that. Uh, the area di director had several comments on that, so we're waiting for a new revision. Hi, this is Carlos Bernardos, uh, co-author of the draft. Um, I've been discussing with the co-authors, especially with Luis from Telefonica, and uh, basically we will provide the, our aim is to submit a version this week, so maybe we can also take some break to discuss with Alvaro the, the changes that we provided. So that's uh, our goal. Mm. Yeah, if there's any anything you feel like you know you need to hear what the working group thinks or check the working group, please also uh, send some mail to the mailing list. Um, we also have an IGMP MLD Young model that. Uh, is waiting for the AD to look at, but hopefully ISG will be happy with it and it will move forward shortly. And then we have explicit tracking, which has been stuck for a while. Um, I know the, the author is, is getting some other people involved and um, looks like them, it will move forward. Yeah, Hitoshi. Ah, uh, yes, Hitoshi said. Um... Well, uh, it's a little bit complex. Um, so the requirement from Eddie, as you know, is that uh, we need to definitely uh, include some statement about uh, implementation or uh, experiences given by operators. And uh, because this is a, uh, the intended status is experimental treatment, so lack of uh, such kind of information, so ADs uh, cannot uh, approve as uh, uh, expressed uh, 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 RFC. So now we have been thinking about uh, changes of the intended status to informational, but this is also, there are several concerns given by, let's say, Torres, but Torres is not here. <laughs> Because uh, in the last uh, MBOMBD meeting, uh, expert tracking is, uh, even though there is no wire changes, it's really uh, important as a uh, part of uh, IGMP V3 or MLD V2. So that this kind of functionality must be, must not be maybe informational. So this is something like a, his opinion. And uh, the, this was uh, something like a consensus of the, uh, his previous meetings. So, so this is something like a reason that why it's a little bit stacked and uh, uh, well, so the uh, possibility to make it move forward is that, uh, as you said, uh, we definitely need to get some input from vendors or operators uh, to become a good guideline of this functionality. So. Uh, please read uh, the document and if you're a vendor or operator who has the uh, ex implementation experiences or operational experience, we are really happy to get such kind of information and we can summarize these information and uh, uh, describe the summary into this document and uh, uh, continuously work on as a ex experimental uh, documentation. So the draft will be on hold until you do get that implementation information? Mm, yeah. Even if it's experimental draft? Yes. Okay. <coughs> so we need to, as a working group, help you to get some of that implementation information. Yes, please. That's out there. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, all right, you also have a DR load balancing draft. Um, so it's a long story about that, but um, um, yeah, we'll have a presentation about that in this meeting. Uh, we also have DR improvement. Uh, there's no update this meeting. Um, we need people to review the draft and comment on it. There's also some related draft that will be presented in this meeting. We'll come back to that later. For MSDP Yang, we had um, the other working group last call and no one responded. 
Um, I did a review after that. I should have done it for the last call myself, but it after. Um, the authors have revised the document, and uh, it's probably you know good idea to do a, a new working group last call. I'm hoping since people thought it was ready for last call the last time, people are still thinking it's ready for last call now. Um, so, unless anyone has any concerns, um, we plan to do a working group last call again, and then. Um, we just really hope that some of you will, will respond so that we can move this draft forward to an RFC. Um, okay, we also have a young model for IGMP MLD snooping. Uh, we have a presentation for that this meeting as well. That should be close to completion. Um, and there's a draft on IP IP4 prefix or IPv6 next hop that also will be presented this meeting. So that's the status of all the current working group documents. Any questions before we move on to the presentations? All right. Okay. So let's see. So first presenter is uh, Yusong. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yi Sung from Huawei. Uh, I will introduce the uh, IGMP and MMD snooping YAM model and the IGMP and MMD YAM model uh, updating information. Uh, firstly, uh, for the IGMP and MMD snooping YAM model, uh, uh, from the uh, last uh, ITF, we have uh, uh, updated uh, according to the uh, draft ITF net mode RFC uh, 6 or 8, 7 bits and uh, uh, other review comments. And uh, we will uh, we'll also update after the, uh, this FTF for the uh, comments from the young doctor. Uh, the, the first uh, um, mainly we update uh, is the uh, robustness variable uh, parameters uh, range uh, change from the uh, two to seven to the uh, one to seven because uh, in the RFC uh, that uh, the value can be uh, one and uh, uh, so we uh, uh, discussed and decided to uh, add the uh, range of that. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, the the second uh, mainly uh, update is that we add uh, an example of the uh, data tree uh, followed by the JSON encoding. Uh, uh, for example, this is the uh, IMP snooping instance. Uh, so. We are uh, in. Uh, we discussed in the uh, young design team. We are ready for the working group last core. Okay. Any comments for this draft? So uh, maybe I'm mixing up with a different draft, but this was the last time they got the young doctor review on, right? I think uh, the young doctor review has. Been, uh, and, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. The young doctor uh, have revealed, but uh, we, uh, we 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 wanted to uh, uh, in the young design meeting, and uh, we discussed uh, and uh, uh, respond to the to the young doctor, and and uh, and then we we think mm. we can we can start to the last course. So you think it will be just small changes needed to. Uh, you know, uh, we, 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 we think we don't need to change. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, because based on the review, it looked to me like maybe, you know, there were not some bigger changes. But yeah, if you don't need to do that, then, then that's fine. Yeah. Um, so I guess we should ask the room maybe. Um, so 
yeah. How many people have read this draft? The, let's see, um, about five, six people, six people, I mean. Um, so how many of you think that this is ready for last call? Uh, uh, let's see. Okay, it's roughly the same people. Anyone have any issues or think that something must be addressed before it can go to last call? Okay, I think we'll do a last call on the list then. Uh, right, Mike? Yeah, we need to, to do that. Um, with these Yang model drafts, it's always like pulling teeth to get response on the list. But at least a few people that have just raised their hands can respond on the list. That would be enough for us to progress this draft. And that's true for the other Yang draft as well. Yeah, so I think we should do a last call for MSDP right after this meeting. And then when you have, um, you know, published your next revision, okay. assuming it's only small changes, we'll do our last call on, on that one. Okay. And uh, the second, uh, we introduced the uh, IGMP and MLD Yamado. Uh, from the last uh, ITF, we have uh, it made some updating uh, from the comments and uh, the AD and the chairs comments. Uh, firstly, we update uh, according to the uh, ITF main model RC uh, seven <coughs> six or eight seven bits, and mainly the part of the security considerations and the uh, reference the information and and the. And the same, the same as the IDMP snooping young model, we also uh, updated the range of the robust uh, from uh, 2 to 7 to 1 to 7. Uh, we can, we think that we, we can ready to start the last call. Well, um, so this, sorry, so this one was the, just the, not snooping, right? Just basic IGMP MLD. But that's already, um, Approved for publication, right? Oh, um, I so don't, I do not understand the the the, the uh, <coughs> period of the of right the process. right. Oh. So, okay. if I remember correctly, for for this draft, mm -hmm. we requested publication, uh, but then the young doctor had some comments, and um, and I think we were waiting for you to review that before. Our AD would, you know, review mm -hmm. the document okay. further. So uh, I'll, I'll go and check. But yeah, I believe that uh, the next step now will be that uh, Alvaro probably will review the draft okay. and determine, you know, if it's ready for ISG. Okay. But for the snipping one, we, we need to do a lot of work in the class. Okay. Call. Okay. Do you review Yang drafts, Alvaro? Is that something you do? Yes. So, uh, yeah. So usually the process is um, if it hasn't been through the doctors, then I send it through the doctors. But if it's already been there, then I take a look, and you know whatever issues are there, uh, just like any other draft. So yes. Okay. That's okay. All. So yeah, all is good. <laughs> we'll move forward yeah. with the drafts. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So this is small update for the draft DRL load balancing. So basically, I think it got uh, adopted as a working group in IETF 82. And there was a big pause in between. And finally, IETF 99, I did present it in Singapore. And IETF 100, we had some comment from Jack Holland. And I did update the document. And just two hours back, I think he has sent me some more comment. But after uh, addressing his comment, I think it is ready for working group last call, until unless there is a, any other comment. No? Then we are good. Is this the last slide? Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, let's do it. You're on this. Yeah, I better go because you're on this one, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, so we discussed this briefly on the list. We said we would discuss it here in this room. So um, who believes that this draft is ready for a uh, working group last call? Do any of you believe that it's not ready for working group last call? Who has read this draft? Okay, so we've got a couple. So those of you that read the draft, I'm assuming then you don't think it's quite ready for working group last call. Is that true? So I'm just so, gonna I'm just gonna ask one more one last time because we're kind of done with this draft, but I don't want to force it. So um, does anybody in this room feel that this draft is ready for working group last call? So I don't see any hands. Do you believe it is? Okay, I got a hand. All right, we got a hand. All right, so. We will, <laughs> we will need to take this to the list. Sure. Um, if we can get a couple responses, then we'll move it along because there's no fans against. Okay. It's just there's not a whole lot of interest apparently. Sure. So, so next topic to discuss. So, so I think we already have there is a draft which is uh, PIM DR improvement and it talks about backup DR mechanism. And so I'm just trying to capture once again here that what what is the problem the other draft is solving so if you see here we have a receiver at the end and there are two paths to source i have kept it very simple and the left side the r8 and r9 they are pim routers on the lan and r8 is a pim dr right now and all the pim joins are going from r8 r6 r3 towards source and we have data traffic flowing and what will happen if there is a failure here? So if there is a failure, basically receiver is going to get the traffic loss here. And it's not only about the traffic loss, what will be the next step? So basically now R9 becomes the new PIM DR and R9 has to build the whole tree again to receive the traffic from source. So it sends PIM join hop by hop, then we start getting the traffic and that's how receiver starts getting the traffic. But in this case, so there are certain applications, for example, surveillance camera, if they are using multicast, and if there is a big pause of three seconds or whatever time, so there are security concerns, and there could be some important traffic which you don't want to lose. In that case, there are vendors who are ready to have duplicate traffic in the core just to make sure that our, uh, in case of failure, the convergence time is really low. And so basically, in this uh, draft, I am trying to see that if we could have an alternate way other than what PIMDR improvements talks about to solve the same problem. So in this, we are saying, uh, so even the PIMDR improvement drafts talk about having backup DR. So in case of backup DR, what exactly we are doing? R8 here is a DR and R9 is backup DR. Both of them, they will uh, build the multicast tree towards source. Both of them will pull the traffic, but R9 will keep dropping it because it is in the backup mode. And R8 will keep forwarding the traffic. What will happen now if R8 goes, the link between R8 and receiver goes down? In that case, R9 already has all the traffic. It's only a matter of the time when it can detect. And if you're using BFD or any other mechanism to detect it fast, R9 can immediately detect and it can start forwarding the traffic. So it doesn't need to wait for the uh, wait for the new tree to get set up. So um, just to clarify, so so what you presented so far that is true for both the drafts. Yes. Right? Yeah. So now the only what is the difference here? So basically. <laughs> The major difference which we are, uh, which I am proposing here, the draft PIM DR improvement talks about having new hello option to have backup DR election. But I think that we don't need new PIM, uh, new hello option. We can still do it with exec, uh, existing hello option. And I just wanted to take it to working group here to have kind of discussion and maybe have analysis that can we which one will be the better to go with are both of both of the options are good if both are both options are good what exactly we are going to do i mean to say 
do we want to proceed with both of the draft or one of the draft or merging of the draft so let me see if I... okay so in this uh, i think it will be easy with figure what exactly i am saying that if you see now r8 and r9 both are uh, pim routers when they see each other's hello what exactly they are going to do they are going to run the same algorithm of pim dr election and the first whoever is the best router will become the pim dr the second best router becomes pim bdr by default and when you are in the bdr mode you still send the pim join you do everything whatever pim dr does only only thing is that you have to be in block state you you should not be forwarding the data traffic towards the last hop and there, there were few cases, I think I would say more of uh, corner cases which need to be handled that what will happen if new PIM DR comes into the network. So the main concern was that if, if it sends its priority right away, it might happen that the other router, uh, basically other router will give up its role and we will still see the traffic loss. So for that we had that what if you don't send your uh, actual priority right away you send your priority as a zero and you wait for one hello interval to learn about all, all of your neighbors. So after a one hello interval, basically you will have full knowledge of uh, other PIM routers in the network and their DR priority. And once you know their priority, you will be able to calculate whether you are eligible to be DR. If you are eligible to be DR, you start building the tree and still don't give your configured priority you start you build the tree and once your tree is ready you still uh, right now you will be in block state and once you think you are ready and so basically i have written here as a x hello interval because it's more of point to discuss that what should be the value whether it should be one or it should be two depending on that how tolerant we want to make our network and after this x hello interval basically you start sending your original priority and you take over as a dr but if new pim router which is coming up is not a it cannot be a dr so it will be it will know within a one hello cycle that i am not eligible to be a pim dr anyway so it doesn't need to do anything and definitely it can send its own uh, configured priority and there were uh, some concerns about the initial startup case when there are let's say five routers coming up together and if everyone sends zero so basically it, it will be kind of more of uh, everyone is in waiting on everyone else so in this case i i think it is one of the definitely corner case that when the all five routers are coming up together and if we have two hello interval traffic loss i don't think it is a big deal because anyway, your network is coming up fresh. So uh, we can live with one minute traffic loss. So in this case, uh, when you send with zero priority and you start getting zero priority from others, it means that it is time for you to start sending your original priority. So is there any questions here? Um, can you go back to the original picture? Sure. Yeah, so it, it, this strikes me as a really narrow case that you're really just solving a really small part of, for a very narrow case. So you still have the failure detection with or without this mechanism. You have to find out that the, that the, the DR dies. So you have to, it takes time for the, so with or without this, you have that. All you're doing is you're eliminating join latency on one path. Yes. Now, and and you're only doing this for one router. Meaning, what if R6 fails? Like, what if the link between R8 and R6 fails? Then what, right? Then you have to have R8 convert. You have the same exact problem. So all you're solving is join latency for one hop in a many you know, where any other of these hops could also fail and this doesn't solve it. So there's a thing like there's MOFRR that kind of solves those problems. So essentially what this is, is this is just MOFRR at the LAN, uh, receiver LAN. Okay, so to answer your question, basically if you 
I, I think maybe it was not clear. The problem statement of this document, it is the exact same problem statement what one of the working group document is solving. So problem statement is same. Only thing is I am trying to simplify the solution mm -hmm. rather than having DR and backup DR using new hellos. Can we do it with existing hello? So this okay. this document doesn't solve any problem apart problem. from what the document is already solving. So okay. PIM DR improvement, yeah. Uh, and then the other thing is, do we even need to specify this uh, with an IETF document? Because this, what stops an implementation from just doing this anyway? That this seems like an implementation thing that you could do, just have a backup designated router, send joins and sit and hold hold that traffic don't forward on the LAN and you know send it send it out um it seems like it, this could be done as an implementation thing without any kind of itf spec but. uh yeah so it, it is kind of implementation and that was the reason to bring up to working group that do we really need new hellos can we live with the existing hellos fame hello i serve in the here so I see a little bit of issues on this diagram. Like there is in a normal production environment, there's always a link between R8 and R9, like using a VRRP or something. So it's not a three three second or a four seconds outage, it's like a sub-second outage. So there's no real problem to be solved on a service provider side network. We are seeing a big issue, like if you're gonna start sending another traffic on another path, which can be a huge, like for a, for a security company or a monitoring, it's, it's a very small amount of traffic. But think about uh, the video traffic on a video back home where you are running a 4K videos. See, it can be like a tens of gigs of traffic that randomly you don't really necessarily need for a sub-second outage. Once it, these, these scenarios goes into implementation, we would like to see it as an optional, not as, as rigorously put into the protocol itself. So uh, to answer your question, basically, even if it is in the protocol, it won't be like it is must have. It is definitely a need basis. So it's kind of trade-off. So there are there are a couple of customers who really who don't care if, even if you bring three copy of the traffic in the core, but they need faster convergence. So definitely, it is nothing. Nothing stops that you can still go with the existing PIM DR model. But this is the method. This could be one of the method if you really need DR and BDR concept. So I am coming from that line. I'm just gonna second this voice sec. You, yes, we can specify everything. If you want to have an informational draft that somebody could implement or read, it's great. But this is, in my opinion, this is not something we should be specifying as a spec. Actually, to just clarify one more thing, we saw this, like uh, the first commenter, we when he commented this can be alternative methods. So we saw this method today by sending a clockwise and an anti-clockwise copy like using other methods. So there's already a two, two copies coming to the receiver side, but not necessarily doing this method. Sure. Any other questions? So I have one question. So when people say that this doesn't need to be specified or it's not that important or so, do you feel that way about the um, the working group, the the current working group draft as well, or or do you see these solutions being different? I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention closely enough <laughs> on, on, the, on the when the first draft came along. So I, I I'd have to read that one. So um, that's on me. My bad. But if, if, if that draft says the same thing, I would say the same thing about that, that this is, um, this seems like a really, really small optimization for a, only a, for a one failure in a really long tree. Yeah, so basically we have, we have two drafts in pretty much the same space. We need to see, is there a need for both of them or none of them or one of them? Okay, my vote is none. Um, <laughs> but without looking at the other one. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, if we are to do it, I think it should be something that doesn't require any changes to the protocol because um, like it shouldn't change any hello. It should just work with the way it works. And, and, and an informational, like you said, if, if anything, make it informational, but make it something that, you know, because this feels like more of a, an implementation optimization. I just want to add other thing on top of it is that 
you know, in a normal production environment, the, as I said, the, you, you should have a link between R8 and R9. In this diagram, you're assuming that the best path for the R9 is on the other side. But it may or may not be true. What, what about if the R9's path, best path is also to, to the R8, right? And in that case, if your R8 goes down, your router is still remains the same, regardless you have a DR and a BDR. Yeah, so it will totally depend on your uh, network topology. But that's what I'm saying. Like, if you're going to depend on the implementation side, there are other methods which can already solve this problem. Sure. So, okay. So I think we need to have more discussion on the mailing list to see what kind of interest there is in this draft and also maybe the existing working group draft and. Uh, see if people have thoughts on how useful they are or, or which solutions they prefer. So please please send your thoughts to the list and we'll continue there. Yeah, sure. <coughs> so the next draft, basic uh, next draft, it talks about uh, PIM DR shutdown. So PIM DR shutdown is not exactly the shutdown. It's more of maintenance mode. So in real production network, when your PIMDR is going on the product uh, maintenance mode, how gracefully we can hand over the responsibility to new DR. And again, this document is being presented first time, and we want to have uh, more kind of discussion and feedback to see that how useful this could be in uh, real network. And so today, what happens when if PIMDR is going down? So it's it could be because of maintenance, it's going down, and new PIMDR is taking over. This is one case. Second case could be, which I have not specified here, I think. Uh, second case could be when your new PIMDR is coming up, and it is eligible to be a DR. When new PIM router is coming up in the network, and it is eligible to be PIMDR. So any transition, when DR transition is happening, how gracefully we can do this? So in summary, uh, what exactly we are trying to do is trying to see, tr trying to solve it using our uh, hellos. So whoever is the current PIM DR, it can send PIM hello with priority zero. And it will have new option of saying that, hey, I'm going in the maintenance mode. And it could be gracefully shut down or any, any info in that option. And current PIM DR will also make its assert metric to infinity and why exactly we need it i think it will come into the next slide when we talk about the hybrid mode where some of the pim router do support this specification and some of them don't support and when new pim dr election is done new pim dr will start building the tree it will start forwarding and as and when duplicate traffic starts hitting the the previous dr it will keep pruning uh, all the tree states and that was the reason, basically, we wanted to have uh, assert metric as infinity, so that even in case when you are getting duplicate traffic, it shouldn't happen that by mistake the older the PIM DR who is going down wins the PIM assert, and it, it still becomes for order. So if you see in this uh, case, we have uh, four PIM routers, and I have specified uh, their priority and right now the rightmost router is the pim dr who is forwarding the traffic and i am not showing the core this here to make uh, this figure simple and the router with priority 110 it wants to go down for maintenance so now what exactly it can do so basically it will send a new hello and with priority 0 and with new option as a gr and once this hello is received by each of the neighbor, they will process and they will do DR re-election. And now between two routers who have same DR priority, the router on the leftmost becomes the DR. And it will start building the tree. And it will start forwarding multicast, tree, multicast data traffic. So once if you see the data traffic start hitting back in the 110, so basically it is kind of uh, you start getting traffic on your forwarding interface, and that's when assert will kick in. And 110 should prune its uh, complete multicast traffic. 
And what will happen if some of the router don't support this specification in the network? And uh, so th there are two cases. If the router who doesn't support this specification is uh, to be PIM DR, then exact same step should be followed. And if the router who doesn't support this specification cannot be a PIM DR, it doesn't need to worry because there is a there is no uh, there is a there is no change needed. And the other option, uh, other way, uh, the next uh, third option is if the PIM DR itself doesn't support the new PIM DR doesn't support this specification. Basically, it will start forwarding right away, and assert mechanism will take care that the other router automatically prunes the data traffic. Yeah, any questions? Questions? Feedback? So I'm, I'm a little confused by the assert part because usually assert is for transit lands for joins going from router to upstream routers in the transit land. Mm -hmm. Asserts don't usually happen on the land with receivers. So are these PIM asserts? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and are they needed? Or why are they needed? No, so they so uh, that is the one option to basically detect because if you don't do this, so it's kind of timing mechanism. You have to do some kind of timing, right? So when one guy is leaving, and another guy has to take this, take the role. Mm -hmm. So th there were a couple of other options which we thought about. One one of them was timing, but you cannot make sure that the one is leaving at the same time when other one is picking up, right? Okay. So assert was one of the mechanism which we think, but yeah, if you think there are some alternate ways, yeah, feedbacks are welcome. Why can't, um, can why why not just have the guy who's going down just send out a lower metric without any hello, special hello mechanisms or anything, just sh send out a lower DR priority, and then he would lose DR ship, somebody else would take over, and then they would take over from there. Uh, is is the assert resolving the switch from one to the other, or what? No, so so this is definitely that is one option to do it, but this is to avoid any traffic loss. So basically, it's kind of you are saying that right now you are DR. When you say that now I'm not DR, you maybe you lower your metric to zero. Mm -hmm. So you have to give other time other uh, DR to build its own tree and then start forwarding. Okay. Yeah. So what what if, if if I'm going to be a DR, I continue. Uh, if I'm a DR, I'm going undergoing maintenance. I mm -hmm. just I send out. I, I set my DR priority to zero, mm -hmm. but I keep forwarding until I see somebody else forwarding, and then that's when I know stop doing that. Um, yeah, would that, that could, be a, a mechanism? Yeah, that could also be one of the mechanisms. Yes. Um, I mean, uh, again, this seems like an, an implementation thing, or or at least at at the very least, if it, it is. It's, it, you know, it's. I think it could be specified for informational purposes, but sure. I, I think it's better than having a new hello option that then you have to worry about do implementation support it or not support it. And I think it'd be easier to just do this without changing the protocol at all. Sure. So just just want to clarify when the assert is happening, the DR right, the other B, other DR, DR is coming active. So you are assuming that the DR will keep forwarding the traffic. And there will be basically two copies coming. For transient time, yes. So just to let you know, in the world, if you go look at the receiver side, they don't take the two copies of the multicast very well. So you're going to end up having an outage anyways. OK. Um. Yeah, so I guess I'm a bit involved with this draft myself. So not as a chair, but as an author. Um, so you basically have the choice, right? When you transition the DR role, either you accept some gap in the packets, might drop some packets before you get the new forwarder, or you try to have make it smooth like this, where you might get duplication of a packet or two. So it's kind of like a depends on what you prefer, really. Uh, it's really hard to make sure that you have no drops and no duplication. You kind of have to choose one or the other. But uh, yeah, the issue with asserts is basically 
then Garnet is becoming the new DR. He, he adds this interface to his OIF list. So if the old DR keeps forwarding, he will see like, oh, I'm getting a packet on my outgoing interface. I should send an assert. Then the all of the previous DR, if you don't do anything special, will respond by also sending an assert and might actually win the assert and and to possibly be the forwarder even though he's going down. So there's some so to make this work, you kind of want some small adjustments to how asserts are handled. What would it can you bring up that picture again? What if uh, as the guy's going down on the right, uh, what if he sends his join to the he knows he knows who the backup DR is. What if he sends his join to the backup DR? Um, would 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 that work? And then then he can prune his branch. You eliminate duplication because I, I think that's a great point that duplicate packets have sh have proven to be far worse than lost packets uh, for certain applications. Not video, but it's usually the financial guys have all kinds of problems with with duplicate packets. Um, so then, then you can kind of get your make before break type behavior. So basically, you're saying the router with hundred priority is supposed to send join towards one ten? No, the other way around. The guy who's one ten who's going down for maintenance okay. sends a join to the one hundred first. Then the one hundred guy gets join state, okay. and he he joins it, and then the one ten guy drops his br dr priority to zero. Uh, then, then you can eliminate that gap. Though it's creating a different gap, but it's probably the sh a shorter gap. And it. Yeah. Um, I, my, my, please. I mean, typically, if the the backup gets the join and he's not the dr, he's gonna not pass it on, right? So you need to tell him at the same time. Why not? Well, it, it, because let's so let's say let's say one ten, his upstream link dies. His shortest path could be through one of those other three routers. So he could be sending a join to one of those other three routers. Yeah. The only problem is, um, you, I mean, you can do that, but you still have the assert problem because the the guy that receives the join. If he sees traffic that is still forwarded by the DR, he will assert. So you can do kind of make before break. The, the thing though know, is in the usual scenario when the routing changes, the assert metric will be better for that other guy, so he will win the assert. But if you send a join even though you are actually the best one, but you still send a join to the other guy, then uh, you will do a search and he will have the lowest metric. Yeah, All right, so um, yeah, I think for this one as well, um, if you have more comments here, that's great. Otherwise, we would like to hear from you on a mailing list. The list is really quiet in general, but hope some of you can comment to this. Uh, yeah, I don't think I should touch this here, so I think I will present it. Um, where is it? Thank you, Makamana. Are you going to can resume now? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm one of the co-offers, so yeah, so I'll do this one. Um, so the problem we are solving here is um, when you basically when you do when you build an R. Um, Build, build a PIM tree, or RPF tree, whatever you call here. You basically send a join to your RPF neighbor. So you look up in the rib to find who is the next stop towards the source or RP, and you send a join there. Um, but if you are using RFC 5549, 
when you look up a before address, your, your next stop is a V6 address. Um, yeah, your next stop is a V6 address. So then you can't expect that you will have a PIM6 neighbor you can send a join to. But, but for a before S, G, you actually want a before neighbor. So the, the question is, in a way, you have your IPv4 PIM neighbors, you have an IPv4 S, G, but unfortunately your next stop is IV6 address because of C5549. So you want a way of finding out which, which, which V4 PIM neighbor has that V6 address so we can send V4 join to the right V4 neighbor. And as it turns out, we have the uh, secondary address list option in RFC 7661, 7761, which takes care of this problem. The only thing is, in, in, in that RFC, um, it's expected that um, the address list is the same address family as the, um, the base protocol. So, so it's a before hello, you expect it to be a list of before addresses. What we want to do is the exact same as that hello option says it should do, except it's a different address family. We want to list V6 addresses in the hello so that we can know which V4 neighbor to join to. So we agreed in the working group like two IETFs ago that this is a useful solution. It was adopted and um, nothing has happened with the draft the last two IETFs because we haven't got any further input. So the offers basically believe it's ready for last call, unless people have any concerns about the current draft. So it's a very simple draft. It's informational and saying, oh, we can use the existing address list option to solve this problem. Uh, and it just says that in that case, it's okay to you know use a different address family. All right, so as an offer, um, can this go to last call or what do the chairs think? Yeah, Works so um, let's pull the room. So who uh, feels that this draft, this PM working group draft is ready for working group last call? So I see three hands, very good. Um, who, do any of you feel that it's not ready for working group last call? Okay. That's zero hands. So um, we'll ask the same question on the list, and mm. hopefully at least those three people will respond. <laughs> mm. And um, thank you. Yeah. All right, great, thanks. Um, yeah, so it looks like we will have several traps coming to last call, but before the next ITF, that's, that's cool. Um, all right. Let's see. All right, so uh, I have this, this draft that I've been working on with Alvaro. So it started out as a more like a process kind of thing, ITF process thing, where we realized that um, there's several um, RFCs using PIM reserved bits, or basically saying that some of the reserved bits should not be, yeah, should be used for specific purposes. Like, 50, like BSR 5059 talks about using a specific bit to mean no forward. PIM binder 5015 uses mm -hmm. four more bits for that purpose, for some other purpose, and so on. Um, but those RFC never updated the original RFC 4601 that says those bits are reserved. So we kind of wanted at least one document to update the PIM sparse mod RFC and say, oh, these bits are not treated as restored for these message types. Also, we figured it's good to have some kind of registry where people can go and see for which messages are which bits used. So that's one thing that this draft does. The other thing this draft does is trying to expand the, extend the PIM type space. So you see down here for 13, 14, and 15, it 
that extended type. So we're trying to find a way of ex extending a type space because today we only have 16 message types and we already have used 12 of them. Um, and we think this could be one way of, um, of extending the space so we get a lot more options. Um, so the proposal is that this is the, at the top here is the regular PIM header that says that we have eight bits that are reserved. Um, and as I was showing, some message types actually use some of these bits for certain purposes. And what we are proposing is that for message type 13, 14, and 15, we say that the four leftmost reserved bits, actually I can use that pointer, I guess, maybe. Maybe not. Oh, yeah. So basically we are saying that for those three message types, we take some of these reserved bits here and, and make them, them form a subtype. So the idea is that for, you know, it's like message type 13 would not be assigned to one specific um, protocol, I should say, but rather we would for message types like 13.0, 13.1, and so on. So each new use or whatever PIM message messages, each new PIM message we define would use some subtype. So 13.0, 13.1, and so on. So that means that existing existing implementations, they ignore these types because they don't know what they are used for, right? But when you implement in the future some PIM message, say 13.0 or something like that, that means that you will have to implement code that, that also looks at this field here to distinguish the message types for 13, 14, and 15 so that they can have a different purpose. This is exactly what was done for PIMBinder. Um, PIMBinder has several new message types, but uh, instead of using a, uh, like several PIM main message types, it just used like a subtype for each of them. So it's basically saying that instead of using just the, the uh, four bits we have for the message types today, we will, for 13, 14, and 15, include four additional bits as part of the time. So it's a backwards, uh, backwards compatible way of adding basically 48 new message types, or I should say adding 45 we are taking three messages away, kind of, and adding 48. All right, so, yeah, I would like to see if people have been just in this, if it should be a working group document. Any questions for Stig? Any interest in... Um, this work within the PIM working group. I see a hand up. Some curious pe people didn't read it, people don't care, um, or yeah, have no opinion, or it doesn't matter. Or, uh, Okay, um, let me just let me just ask the question. So, yeah, maybe can ask okay, good. Sorry. One question though: Do people agree that we should look for ways of extending the, the message types? Do we need more than potentially more than three more PIM message types in the future? Is it like we don't need to solve a problem, or this is not the right way of solving a problem? Today, three seems a lot. So, you know, like uh, solving future problems today, when we have a way to, to still solve them in the future, you know, like. Yeah, so I'm basically trying to solve this before it's too late, right? Because if we assign them the remaining P message types, then we don't have an easy way of extending it. Yeah, that, that uh, means that uh, we would have to assign all three, uh, all the bits. That means 90% of people in this room would have to stop coming to PIM for that to happen, if not 100%. So the chances of that are not high. 
that you know and and once we add this then we have to you know it it will it's a cascading work make work effort for for future that may never happen it may but it may never so right. if somebody comes and hears my messages i'm missing let's fix it but like well let's extend it. yeah but yeah just to clarify the way this proposal is today um uh, if if this if this were to become an RFC, then there's no implementation work needed right now. But if anyone wants to implement one of these future options, that future message types that use use this stuff, then they will have to implement parsing and checking all those bits. So you can say, um, even if we do make this an RFC to be prepared for the future. We don't actually have to implement anything until the future comes here and we actually need those new types. So. Do you want me to ask about work here? Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm done here. Okay, so we've already said one person raised their hand. I think this kind of work would be interesting in this working group. Let's just ask the question that we'll ask on the list, and that is. Um, who here feels that this is a draft that we should adopt? Okay, we have two hands. Thank you. Who feels that this is a draft we should not adopt? Okay, so no, no hands. There is a comment though. Perhaps the, quest, the best question really is, is this a problem we should be solving? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good you question. may not necessarily agree with his proposal, but mm. there is an issue. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Mm. So that's what I sort of asked at the end. Is I'm curious, did people think that this this problem is yeah needs solving or or not? <laughs> I, I think the normative word there that I was missing is now, right? So mm. I think uh, we we may easily procrastinate on this for for much longer. Yeah, but okay. Uh, yeah, you guys may not yeah. agree with me, but at least our options, you know, we will have less options if we start assigning those remaining types without doing anything. I agree with the now comment. If we had, if we had a problem to solve now, 100%, I, I like what you're doing. Uh, if you ask me, is this a problem that we need to solve now? I would say no. Yeah, so I'm I'm happy to keep the draft, you know, just keep refreshing the draft and when we actually need and one new message pin message types, I can ask do we need this? Yeah, I, I agree with the same thing. Like if there's no problem to be solved right now, then why assign these bits or something? There might be a better use case or a better problem to be solved in the future if it becomes mm -hmm. an RFC. Then mm -hmm. these bits are gone basically, right? And I'm coming from another session, they are saying that there's no undo like if it goes into a draft, there's no going back, right? There's no unadopt. We don't do unadopt, right? So if you don't do unadopt, then it will basically mean if even if we are on the wrong path, we'll continue on the wrong path. There's no nobody wants to crack, nobody wants to, to admit that we have made a mistake. Um I'm uh, not speaking as an author, speaking as the routing ID. Uh, the fact that we adopt anything doesn't mean that you have to publish anything. Uh, you may run out of interest in whatever you adopt and never publish it, or you can change your mind. And do something different, right? So the fact that it's adopted doesn't mean that you're stuck with anything. Not just for this draft, but for any other draft that has been already adopted. Um, just yeah, there is, for example, the parking position for for drafts as well that I saw on Data Tracker, right? So there seems to be all type of things. But you know what? The the minimum to do is uh, you can even let it expire. And every time somebody comes up with a new draft and wants to take a code point then bring this really up again and then maybe people you know that want the new draft are also a lot more interested to uh, <laughs> take looks and start having opinions yeah at least some hope at least my hope is that uh, when next time someone actually gets a code point they won't actually get like type 13 but they actually maybe get you know something slightly different and, and that's, that's a decision that the working group come up with like yeah we want this progress but sorry we're going to make this pending on getting you know yeah. Um, a new subcode point from the extended space. Yes, yeah, so I guess the question is, is, is there any way anybody can do an end run around this group? 
-hmm. in which David Allen Erickson, uh, and in which case then is there some way to go to IANA and change the allocation policy right. for the last few bits just to say it has to come through here? Right. No, we, we have we have full control. Uh, we won't there won't be any assignments unless there is an RFC and it has to go through this group generally speaking at least. Right. Uh, right. I'll go to Ruthana. So if you go to the first slide, uh, you sort of say that this was sort of a process thing. Yes, uh, the process two, being there's the, two different problems being solved here, so right. I have a question regarding that. But right, I, I just wanted to point that out as well, that yeah. uh, 42, whatever the number was, um, uh, 4601 and 7761, neither one of them say how to assign these bits. Yeah. And even though they don't say that, 5059, 5015, and 8364 actually took bits from there. So, yes, theoretically, there is no way for anyone to assign those bits, but we already did, right? And and yes, those documents went through this working group, but in theory, if someone else from say a different working group decides to assign a bit there for whatever reason, I don't know why, uh, the only way to stop it would be if one of you reviews the document and points that out, if the AD, me or someone else finds that out, and figures out that there's no allocation policy in the registry and, and decides to stop it or, or whatever else. For all those three RFCs, no one really noticed until it was too late, right? And, and so, you know, that's the point, right? That, that there's two problems here. One is the problem of just updating the registry. And so, yes, we could write a one-page document that says update the registry to say this, whatever we decide, you know, uh, specifically required or ITF review or whatever we want to do. And, but then we thought that while we're doing this, we might as well just do the right, well, I'm gonna say the right thing and and define what the bits are actually used for uh, in the future, not just change the allocation policy. Because of course, if I'm going to use the next bit, I'm going to want 13, right? I'm not going to come to the working group and say, oh, no, no, I want 13.1 or whatever, right? I'm gonna want 13. And then we're probably going to say, well, okay, let's wait till 14, and then we're only left with two bits. And then, so in any case, we, we probably have to do something if it's at least to to clear up what the allocation policy is. Yeah. So at least one option is if, if the working group don't think we are ready for extending the type space, is to um, revise the document and just have a document defining the registry. Uh, just just take that get that part done. Did you? Did you foresee any one want to add subtypes to existing types? No, don't want to do that because you know that mean that's not backwards compatible, right? Well, I mean, I guess some of the are you know some of the things we talked about earlier were like modifying hellos and setting different priorities, and you can yeah. And so I'm just suggesting that maybe yeah. we could do that sort so, of thing. So you know that's that's why I'm I want to do this now because I'm hoping to avoid that happening. The problem is if an implementation. It's not updated that doesn't know about subtypes, right? It it's it will just ignore the, the restored bits because that's what restored bits means. And it will then go ahead and answer even if its message was not stuck. I guess yeah. so I was kind of seeing you could have a like an act subtype for the new subtype that you have, right? Because you got all that extra space then. Yeah. So you can say, do you do you support the yeah. feature? And you can say Okay, it. right, right. Yeah, so yeah, so just okay, one thing I want to say is so you know, the point is, if if the um, if the person here is says Pim hello, right? If someone doesn't know about this subtype, they will. Uh, I mean, if the type here says hello, a router that doesn't know the subtype would then think, oh, this is an hello, and it isn't. But yeah, you could. Um, what you potentially could, at least for messages that are linked local, you can have a new hello option saying I support extended types or whatever, right? And just say you only use the new type of messages if all the routers on the land say they they support support that. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know. Um, we could take it to the list maybe if that's okay to see if people are interested, or I can uh, revise the draft to just um, create a registry and, and not worry about type extension at this this time. Your call. Yeah. Well, if if yeah, if you can check for interest on the list first, that would be cool. Okay. Mm. Okay. Let's...
We got gray now. Get queued up, Greg. Okay, I'm ready. All right, cool. Um, Thanks, God. All right, we are ready. Can you see the slides yourself? Or? Yes, yes, okay. thank you. Um, okay, so um, we presented this uh, in London, and the proposed solution is to use uh, BFD for multi point uh, network specification. Uh, with the uh, head at uh, DR. So the DR, uh, non-DR um, PMSM routers uh, can monitor the well-being and uh, availability of uh, DR. Uh, included in this proposal is uh, extension to PIM hello uh, format so that uh, DR uh, bootstraps non-DR routers by advertising its um, discriminator. Uh, that's because the specifics of uh, multipoint BFD over multipoint networks uh, does not use a freeway handshake, which is a part of point-to-point uh, -point BFD R or RFC 5880, um, where uh, there is no need to bootstrap uh, over IP uh, because uh, each of the routers uh, exchanges uh, control messages and thus um, knows um, remotely a uh, advertised discriminator and can do uh, demultiplexing based on that information uh, that is returned to it uh, by its peer uh, in a packet uh, in a field of your discriminator. Uh, another um, particular um, feature of BFD for multipoint, as it uses the demand mode uh, to begin with, uh, the multiplexing uh, packets are not, uh, as I mentioned, on your discriminator value, but on a combination of the source identity, um, multicast tree and uh, my discriminator value. So that's why it's important to do the bootstrapping before uh, their uh, tails can listen to the head uh, on a BFD session. So that all was uh, discussed in the original version. And before the meeting, um, we had very good discussion on the list, uh, whether it can be uh, extended and used optional um, can be use cases for other than monitoring DR on the shared uh, media. Uh, we think that there might be value for monitoring uh, BDR in the same scenario, though uh, the actions would be somewhat different because electing uh, BDR um, may be uh, Follow the different process, but if we go for the next slide, next slide. I'm sorry for my dog. <laughs> I have no control of him. So uh, this is the format of uh, how we propose to exchange um, um, their discriminator information, and we can go to the next slide. So the update is that uh, this uh, can be optional, um, optionally used by other than uh, DR to monitor uh, in other scenarios. So 
that is open for discussion and um, um, I believe the stick suggested it could be used uh, for the assert. Um, another interesting functionality that um, monitoring well-being in a demand mode gives us that uh, the BFD session can be used to signal um, that the router is not longer or the functionality that we associate the BFD session with is not longer available. So, for example, uh, there was a question in an uh, earlier uh, presentation. Uh, so, if what if upstream router uh, fails, uh, what their uh, how it can affect their uh, roles and behavior on a shared uh, segment between DR and BDR? Um, if on a shared segment we have BFD session, then DR can take the BFD session down, thus expediting the switchover uh, between the distribution tree. So uh, we can uh, discuss uh, other scenarios and definitely uh, bring them into the document. Um, so the next slide. Uh, we welcome comments. Uh, we have a uh, very good discussion uh, and uh, everybody is welcome to join. And we would like to ask working group to consider adoption of this document. Any, any comments, questions? So, um, I know there are several implementations uh, using BFD for PIM today. So this is just, um, I was gonna say, if you already have BFD for PIM, this is pretty much similar, right? The only difference is that you don't have a full mesh you have, or you utilize multicast on the local link, right? Right, and uh, that that is one probably uh, benefit you don't have to do full mesh of point-to-point -point BFD sessions, and another is that you don't create a necessary state on DR because in this particular scenario, um, it's only tails or non-BDR or non-DR nodes that are interested in a state of DR. Uh, DR is not interested in uh, state of other nodes uh, on a shared link. Right, Be <laughs> because BFD is normally bidirectional, but this is more like a one-way thing, right? Yes, precisely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm also realizing, uh, yeah, there are several implementations of PIM BFD, but there's no, no doc document describing describing it at all, I think, existing document. Yeah. Um, actually, one note that uh, I can make that uh, there uh, BFD for multipoint uh, networks uh, specification is uh, in ISG last call, and together with their, uh, another version with their, what we call active tails, so that when tails uh, have an option of notifying the head of um, the continuity, so whether they uh, receive uh, BFD control messages or they detected the failure. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess um, so. How many people have read this draft? Raise your hand if you read it. Two people, so that's not too much. Um, um, who thinks we should adopt this draft? I guess, <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, one hand. Um, anyone opposed? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm actually, yeah, I'm, supporting adoption myself so two people 
for adoption, I guess, and non against. <laughs> we'll have to take that to the list, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so while Dave's working his way up here, I just wanted to give a brief background on this draft being presented here in PIM. So, um, multicast is not, and you may have your own take on this, Dave, but so multicast is not currently specified within the spring working group for segment routing. Um, it's not part of their charter. There was a recent rechartering discussion, and as far as I know, multicast was not included as part of that rechartering. So, we've agreed for now to address, since we're protocols for IP multicast, we agreed to um, uh, look at these types of drafts that have to do with multicast and segment routing. And um, there's been some different, there's been in the, like in the last ITF, we have a, we had a presentation with regards to beer and segment routing. Um, in this case, Dave is going to introduce a, another solution for multicast and segment routing. Um, and that's, that's why he's here. Is that, is that about right? Close enough. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Say that again. Tree Sid. I, I don't I don't know if it's proprietary, but it's a scheme that you know Cisco was uh, showing at Cisco Live for uh, segment routing with the uh, programmed uh, point to multi point uh, replication labels. Is it being discussed right. here? I I I don't know. Okay. Ma'am, it's Nokia. I, I don't think that three seed was ever brought to the ITF. I think there are some uh, extension for the uh, PGP SRT that might be used for three seed, but my understanding is it was never brought into the ITF. I Proprietary or not, I don't know, but uh, you're right. It is out there. I believe it is described in a draft, but the draft, I think, is at zero zero, and they did not ask for agenda time. Um, but that, that's that's my my supposition. I just know I have seen it yet mentioned. I think in a policy draft. Okay. I I, th I thought it was. Sorry. Uh, I thought it was part part of the. It was briefly explaining the PGP SRT draft or something like that. But I don't think it has a draft of its own, unless I'm mistaken. Okay, so for to be clear, this is not TreeSid. <laughs> okay, so what is this draft about? It's about using computation to determine the routing of a multicast segment, which I would say is probably analogous to a TreeSid. Uh, this is for an MPLS-based SR network, uh, and how we can use tunneling using node SIDs as part of the tree construction. Uh, and this could either be a distributed or a centralized control model. If it's a distributed control model, for example, the expectation is, is multicast membership would be advertised in the IGP, and when combined with knowledge of the topology, a multicast tree can be computed uh, by a node, and it can figure out its role in it, including whether it would be tunneled over or not. So the draft describes the couple of tweaks to the terminology that's required to incorporate this concept into segment routing, gives an overview of the overall approach, describes how to do loose or explicitly routed multicast distribution trees, provides an algorithm for tree construction, uh, and goes into FIB installation procedures. So the motivations. Um, the biggie in doing this was to reduce the amount of state in the network because multicast state can rapidly dwarf unicast state. In a previous life, I worked on shortest path bridging, and in any sort of network design that I worked on, the amount of multicast state very quickly blew out the, uh, the unicast state in terms of the FIB construction. Um, to give you an example of this, if I um, well, to really to cut to the chase, for most multicast trees that are flat, the amount of state ends up being some function of network diameter. 
Now, if I'm using the existing mesh of node SIDs that is already there, and I only have to install state at the root, at the leaves, and any intermediate replication nodes, then you can quickly figure out that in absolute worst case, the amount of state is going to be two times the number of leaves, because that's the number of additional replication points I would need in the network. And that's completely independent of the network diameter, whether it's three nodes in diameter or a thousand nodes in diameter. So that is a rather massive production in state. Next chart. The other motivation is to leverage the MPLS data plane and segment routing as much as possible. And you, this notion of you being able to use tunnels as part of the tree construction is using the SRM PLS data plane in ways that, for example, PIM or L MLDP could not. And the other motivation is to be able to implement multicast where beer is not technically or economically feasible. So I'm looking at some, some of the lower end merchant silicon type chips that, where it is not likely they are ever going to be able to implement beer on those particular chips. Um, so that, that's a, in terms of the continuum of solutions, you can say beer is completely state. If beer is completely stateless and PIM is completely stateful, we're coming in somewhere in the middle in terms of what this means for the network. So the approach, the draft describes an architecture where the tree is a hybrid of the roots, the leaves, and the replication points, and this is all interconnected with tunnels. And the routing of the tree is determined entirely from information in the IGP. This could be in a distributed model. This could be using an SR controller. I don't particularly care. Um, these are all valid solutions. It gives you a lot of benefits. First off is it's a minimum amount of messaging to converge the network. If the node knows all the member, the multicast membership and the topology, and there is a topology change, each node has sufficient information to be able to fully converge the network for both unicast and multicast forwarding. So it is only the topology change advertisements that are needed to again to fully synchronize the network. I've already gone into reducing the data plane state. It will actually reduce the bandwidth requirements versus a straight IGP derived tree using joins and things. And there's a specific and serendipitous reason for that is, is that's part of the approach. Unicast convergence will provide recovery for most failures. If you, for example, if I'm in a network with a large number of sparse trees, then most of the time a node or a, a link failure will not actually affect the forwarding of the majority of the trees in the network, or the, even the trees that potentially are transiting or could be transiting that. Unicast convergence will fix it, and that's another property that's taken advantage of. So, an example tree that we can sort of barely fit onto the screen here. Um, I've got a root, I've got four leaves, I have a multicast SID that I'm using as the basic unit of tree construction, and you can see where I'm using the node SIDs uh, to actually tunnel so that, for example, node 14 did not need to install state for that tree, despite the fact that node 14 is transited by that tree. Um, so the net result is, is I've got a total of five nodes that actually have to participate in the tree because they're leaves or roots. They're either going to be sending information or explicitly receiving it. And to fully implement that tree, I only needed to install state in nodes 5 and 12, and all the rest of it took advantage of the, the, the node SIDs that already exist and are maintained by the IGP doing the unicast solution. So in, the, in sort of the big picture, I have a, a reasonably sized tree, in the example, a relatively small network diameter, and the net result was the converged solution only involved two extra nodes having to add state versus, say, for example, with a PIM solution or MLDP, it would have been at least five nodes to do that. So you can see how the amount of state required starts going down quite dramatically. Now, there's a certain attributes that are very desirable for the tree. Uh, what I want is either a minimum cost. Or, Sorry. So the, 
the state reduction comes from the fact that you're doing automatic tunneling over nodes that either don't support the feature or that um, basically don't aren't needed right now as a replication point. Yeah, yeah, it's more that they aren't needed right now. When you at the at the start of the day, everything could be a candidate for be a part of the to be a part of the tree, and, and you it might not support eliminate the feature, them. right? That might be another reason why that you, could be another reason for tunneling over them as well. What's the sorry? Tell me if, if you would rather have the questions at the end, right? So, but other than that, it's easier to. I mean, um, so, what's the reason to call this, let's say, segment routing as opposed to MPLS? Is there any particular, you know, functionality that makes you, other than it sells better with the name SR? It actually <laughs> would work with MPLS, but we were originally starting out with the multicast SID as a global value. Okay. Um, so, uh, and, and drawn from the, the, the global label space. So that actually was kind of the genesis of applying at the segment routing. Okay. Um, given what has transpired since th this work was originally done to allow a global SID to map to a, uh, individual nodes having their own label spaces that do not necessarily overlap, it would be quite reasonable to suggest this could also work in MPLS. Right. Uh, Ilya, uh, uh, so now I uh, try to understand if I need to change dynamically this tree, for example, I need another node that should join between 5 and 11. What does it mean? It means that I need to make multiple changes in states in multiple nodes? Hang on, where is 11 on this? So if, if I haven't say either you know, zero or say for example I have, we have nine that is some some also on the on the path and I want to join ten to this three, right? So it means I need to program nine and five. Um, most likely yes, and it means I need to program them in a specific way. Otherwise, I'm black holing my traffic. Correct. Uh, so just to understand, are you trying to leverage on the unicast the uh, SR uh, to make these trees or like uh, to me it looks like right now what's happening here is that like on node number five you have two unicast uh, tunnel, <coughs> SR tunnel, that right. when you come to five your traffic will be ingress replicated into these two tunnels. Is that, is that the case or did I get this wrong? It's not English replicated. Five would be doing a replicate and and then encapsulate. Okay, but, but these tunnels are, are completely different tunnels that are being presented via different SIDs. Uh, they are the existing node SIDs that would be there as a result of the unicast connectivity and segment routing. Okay, thank you. Uh, they could be just as easily faxed in an MPLS network. So. So I, I think one comment is, yeah, definitely I, I believe that we do need a, a SR type of solution for multicast and, you know, uh, segment routing. Um, but, but right now I see two different methods on, on the table that they're kind of competing with each other. Uh, the three seed where a, a seed ID kind of represents the entire tree end to end. And then you, you have BGPLS, BGP SRTE, that you know sucks up the the configuration of the network and you program it and then you have this method. Um, I would imagine they they need to go into the same group to see the the cons and the pros of each of these and one should be chosen or if two it doesn't matter. But I kind of feel they're kind of competing with each other. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I was specifically asking about MPLS versus SR because it would be lovely to figure out some good technical reason for one or the other instead of just the, oh, wait a second, SR is the best password today, that's why we must use it, right? So right. the technical reasons to make one choice or the other would really be good to document, right? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so the use of tunnels would require um, either a minimum cost or near minimum cost tree in order to be sort of ECMP friendly. And what I say mean by ECMP friendly is I'm trying to avoid making sure that under no circumstances I would get two copies of a packet on any single link. So I'm trying to avoid any possible requirement for logical multicast. 
Now, there is a tree construction algorithm in the draft as to how you can actually produce those trees and do it with a relative minimum of computation. And serendipitously, the algorithm is also the, uh, a source of improvements in bandwidth efficiency because it will tend to ensure that the replication points are shifted towards the edge, uh, closer to the leaves in the network. And that will actually drive up the overall efficiency compared to, for example, PIM or MLDP, where it's relatively random uh, whether they actually pick the, the best and closest uh, point to, to, to join the rest of the tree. So there's also the possibility for loose or explicitly routed trees, where a loose tree is composed of a multicast, a single multicast segment with a SID, where only the roots and the leaves have been specified and the, the connectivity between them is filled in as a result of computation on the database. We can also have an explicitly routed tree, which is basically a concatenation of multicast segments where the roots, the leaves, and the waypoints have been specified, and I, which means I can then engineer a tree to any degree of granularity that I want. So if you're having a sense of deja vu, this has been presented before. The last time was an IETF 97. Um, it's been brought back because, as it turns out, there actually was quite a number of people who were interested in this work, and the disks weren't provided with the vehicle to express that at the time. Uh, so the current draft, it's updated the terminology to align with the current state of SRM PLS, went through it and did some editorial improvements, added a section to describe the motivations, or at least some text. Um, there was some improvements to the algorithm description because, I mean, this algorithm was actually prototyped and actually one interpretation of some of the optimizations in the prototype that were reflected in the text actually made it a bit confusing and I cleaned that up. Um, and it now offers some thoughts on SR controller operation. So it's sort of a new improved for the, over the, uh, the last version that has been presented for those of you who may remember it from back then. So now, to get to next steps, of course, we want to collect feedback. We have some planned updates to the draft in terms of there is some improvement to the FIB installation procedures that are envisioned. Um, I want to see if there's any changes to the draft required to bring it up to the current state of MPLS friendliness in terms of mapping block offsets, et cetera. And as been noted, this also could be applied to MPLS as well once that's done. Um, and in future drafts, we'll be bringing forward the required IGP extensions. We did do a first crack of that back in the IETF 97 timeframe, uh, how to interwork with existing mechanisms. And we are pursuing standards track, of course. Um, and as Mike explained, there's a reason why we're doing it in PIM, uh, and that's because it's not currently in the segment routing charter. So it won't be for a while, it doesn't sound like From the sounds of it, yeah. Jeffrey Dong from Juniper. <clears throat> um, so when we talk about spring, uh, the main the main advantage we're talking about is that it does not have uh, uh, a per tree or per, per per tunnel state in the core. Uh, here, we still have the per tree state in the core. It's just that on those uh, points uh, where you don't have replication, you don't need that state anymore. Right. And if I understand it correctly, you still have still have to flood the group information um, everywhere. I think that's even worse than before. Um, so, um, but you're talking in the IGP, or yeah, yes, okay, right. So, um, so it, 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 this does not really, it, in, in my mind, it, 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 it does not really fit the S spring philosophy. Um, that's, that's one comment there. Um, another thing is that um, we, for spring multicast, we don't really need uh, one solution that fits all situations. Um, quite a, a few of us have, have actually contemplated writing an informational draft on what, how to do multicast in, uh, uh, in a spring network. Um, I think the best, uh, uh, in my view, the best would be to uh, choose whatever suits you best. So if you could do beer, do beer, that, that would be the best. If you don't mind to use the traditional technology, 
just just go with that and because in several in some situations you do you do need the uh, uh, to use the um no, traditional te technology as long as you you don't mind uh, the, the maintain the, those states and then finally if you really just want to remove another signaling protocol yet you still don't mind having the per tunnel state then then just uh, use another way to, uh, uh, way to set up the uh, tunnel the tree seeds uh, well, however it is set up that is it's just one way to do that so you, you realize you are giving me a staggering long list of things to reply to Okay, so I mean, in the Spring Charter, one of the statements it says right off is, is that it does not want to modify the data plane of the existing technologies that it's using. Uh, and so I saw this as about as close as you could come for multicast while preserving the single control plane paradigm. Um, because, you know, I've checked with the vendors, this can be done with the existing MPLS stuff now. Uh, I think that is useful. Um, as for whether or not you end up with path state, you already have the concept of the binding SID, which to me is simply a, a rather cute end run around this, in that the binding SID itself locally does translate into a potential series of local actions uh, that have been configured. So, you know, I, I don't want to get into a philosophical discussion mm -hmm. about this. I just, I still look at this in terms of if we say we don't want to change the data plane and, and hence this can be supported today uh, and we want to go with the simplification of the control plane that's inherent to segment routing, then this is about as good as it gets. Okay. So one, one uh, key follow-up point is that uh, this could be one solution of out of uh, many solutions, but using the wor uh, wording framework, at least uh, um, to me, this does not sound. Well, if we're uh, going to object to the name of the draft, I can change the name, but it's it's a it's a framework for computed. So, <laughs> so let me try my attempt at uh, Sir Lucia whining here. Um, <laughs> So I will, I'm, I'm doing BIRTE, and um, so basically after the rechartering when it became, you know, an adult working group and um, basically the rule was only doing the forwarding plane things and, you know, you're doing control plane, especially traffic engineering aspects, you must go to TEAS. So TEAS is responsible for the traffic engineering. I haven't followed up what really the current state of, let's say, spring is with respect to um, you know, being able to define or do traffic engineering aspects by themselves, or how much piece need to do it. But I would r really love, as a whiner, to have this be done consistently and not only based on you know which working group you're going to. Then randomly, the traffic engineering aspects are going to be dealt with differently, right? So that just as 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 one aspect about the traffic engineering part of this. Okay, so I would take that as a recommendation that if I'm going to have a traffic engineering aspect in this, I should take it to T's. I don't and, know, right? Yeah, I mean, right. I, I, I no. Saying, I, I was. I may just be the sore loser because Beer is being singled out to do that, and Spring is doing their own traffic engineering, and Pim is doing their own traffic engineering. I don't know. All I'm saying is that was you know, what I wanted to whine about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's my concern about this draft. Uh, it's multicast generally not easy. Um, no. Everybody, I think, agrees. Um, we try to simplify it. We put the engine VPN for service providers to deliver. PIM is there. Then the whole problem of control plane and okay, if I'm removing Unicast control plane and putting segment routing, what will I do with multicast? Uh, we solve this with beer. Uh, yes, it changed a data path. If you're using uh, some you know low end uh, hardware. Uh, that was true probably five, six years, oh, okay, no, not five, how many, three years ago when we started here? That was more true three years ago. Uh, I think uh, considering where the technology is now, by the time this will even come to a, a standard, um, you would, I would say that uh, anybody who, ca who, who deploys and thinks of, of control plane segment routing has a hardware that will be able to do either, which means why would we introduce 
something else yet for the same solution and add operational complexity or a solution variation complexity. That would, I, and I'm not arguing, you know, if this was discussed three years ago, maybe a different outcome for a beer would, would happen, maybe not. But today, I think that should be a bar whether we should work on it or not. Why would we work on it? Well, this, um, yeah, well, this was actually first discussed in IETF 95. Um, and I'm not aware of anybody in the lower end ships even contemplating beer. In fact, I dropped it in 97 because my expectation was is that beer was going to sort of go forward, but ultimately, and sort of a bit more ubiquitously than it has. And that hasn't actually really happened, which is why people have suggested I bring this back. And to the best of my knowledge, all major vendors will have working beer in hardware uh, within the 12 routing vendors. Let me let me be, let me clarify. I'm not no offense to people who are not routing vendors who think they are uh, no offense man, but like all those main guys will have a working beer in hardware. So that, like, and again, I'm not arguing that. It, Technically, can we do it? Yes, but does it make sense to yet introduce an alternative solution for something else and, and create complexity of multi, and add again to the complexity of multicast? Because everybody we're talking about multicast, guys, and, and that's probably, well, it's like, oh, multicast, I worry to touch this, to touch this, and adding options doesn't help us. Well, actually, that same question probably could have been asked when MPLS was nearly done and Spring was brought forward, so. MPLS is done, yeah. That's, that's. <laughs> Sorry for MPLS people. I've done some MPLS work. MPLS is done. Okay. Who well, maybe Goldie Nokia? Uh, strong words. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't mean disrespect, but like, as a new vector, like, you know, So, uh, but I do feel. Uh, somewhat in agreement with, with Andrew. I, I think, you know, segment routing already has a bunch of complexity on its own. And now we want to put multicast on top of that. It, it might be a complex solution. That, that said, again, I, I feel that uh, you're right. Some vendors will need SI3 seed or seed or whatever it is that we want to call it to replace a MPLS signal PIMZ with something in a SDN type of level. Um, if we can simplify this by saying like a, a, a seed represents the entire tree end to end and take away that uh, underlay unicast segmented routing complexity, then you know it, it could be a, a good fit side by side with, with beer to have an end to end uh, SDN type of multicast solution. Well, I mean, if you want to run it flat, you could just duplicate what was done for shortest path bridging. So, but that's, as observed, my experience with that is, is you get a significant amount of state once you get into a lot of trees. And the idea was, of the nature of the proposal was to avoid that. Okay, so I'm not sure if I understand that. So you mean that with, with this proposal, it is possible to represent the entire tree with a single seat? Yeah. Is? That's the idea. I, I thought with the SR, each node will. So if you have a node that it, is it, trying to leave, create the uh, leaves, it's going to take two MPLS labels or whatever it is that you guys are taking the seat, one going northwise, one going southwise. Like what you have exactly right there. On node number five, you're using seat 11 going to leaf 11 and seat 13 to leaf 13. So that's two different labels. I'm just stacking them. I'm tunneling. You're, you're stacking them on top of seed five? So the, the, okay, the entire so tree is presented by seed five? Is, is that what you're saying? Say, say this multicast seed is, is seed 53. Then here, the stack is 1153. Here, the stack is 53, because I'm not following. Here, the stack is 1353. Here, the stack is 16.53. So it gets to here, 16 is gone, 53 is okay. the, the, the local interpretation of that SID that is going to give it is to replicate on the 300 basis, and on 
Got it, thanks. Uh, yeah, we're running out of time here too, so okay. yeah, just a quick question. Okay, a quick question to our AD and maybe whoever was familiar with the Spring charter updating process. So the Marticas was not included in the latest uh, Spring charter. Is it because they don't think it's a problem worth solving now, or is it because they uh, please work with other we, we think it should be done, but it should be done in some other working group. Thank you. That, that's a very easy answer. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, just for the record, I'm not the responsibility for Spring. Um, and um, also for whoever's taking minutes, I would have closed Spring. But um, <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, the current uh, responsibility uh, thought that, that we should recharter. I don't know why Multicast is not there. Honestly, I don't know if it even came up in the discussion or not. It um, came also, the discussion that I saw was around uh, you know just updating the current stuff. Um, it so came up. So multicast came up. Uh, I mentioned something on the list. There were several people that were interested in multicast, but the chairs uh, thought that it was not necessary to work on multicast at this time. There you go. I just want to comment on that. Like I'm from the operator side and would not agree with our guys from the vendor side that if the beer is ready in the next two years and the operators will go for a beer model only. So nobody's going to forklift and upgrade the networks in the next two years, right? There will be legacy devices still there and we will need some other solutions other than beer as well. And even if you look at today, there's OSPF and ISIS running, right? There some people use OSPF, some people use ISIS. There's always better to have few solutions like not 100 but at least few better solutions which people can pick and choose, right? And I think it's a, it's a very good solution. You should work on it. The only concern we have on our side would be that what would, how would it scale on a large scale multicast deployments, right? That's would like, because it's a stateful method. And if it can scale for a large scale multicast networks, it's, it's a really good solution. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? What you guys running for multicast now? We run in. Exactly. So uh, two uh, two technology evolutions happen since uh, since PEM for delivery. Okay. No, no, no. That's uh, and, and I another thing, and and we you didn't move for for specific for various reasons. So now now we're gonna have two another solutions and two technology evolutions. And will you move or will you not move? And and like lots of choices. Okay, sometimes good, sometimes not the best. Uh, so I'm not asking again, I'm not saying that a lot of choices. I'm saying like at least 10 solutions should be there or less than 10. 100 solutions is also not good. So it's not a lot. There should be a few solutions to pick from, right? And people have, should have the choice to pick at least yeah, from there. Man. It's a philosophy, it's a culture, like uh, different teams approach is a different way, right? right? Not every network runs ISIS today. Not every network runs OSPF, right? Mm -hmm. so people make the choice. And vendors cannot. I would like to right. see the vendors Will you, forcing. Let, yeah. The, well, I, I would expect this I'm to sorry, have. Just again, guys, because seriously, the times when we could, as vendors, implement million solutions in hardware and software are gone. Those times, I think we all understand that. So, we can talk technology and stuff like this, and then we're gonna come to you guys, and you're gonna say, "Well, I wanna buy it, but it has to cost that much." Well, it cannot cost that much because you wanted this and this and this and this. So in this world of building efficient things that do the, do the work, let's pick up the proper technologies, choices add to complexity. Complexity adds to cost. So it better be a reason. I'm just saying, I'm not saying yeah. I'm against choices, but better be a reason. And I do not see a compelling reason I, well, I, I actually would be highly skeptical of the ubiquitous forklift of the data plane, so the which only, is only what, okay, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting we might be able to avoid. So the only thing I, I would like to say that, like, hey, Trillis, if, 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 we that, don't. if we're going to keep it at that level, then we should Holy be cow. that whether we're going to be working on one IGP in the whole world, we should discuss like how much work is being done on OSPF and ISIS in parallel, right? Why right. we are spending time on two protocols at the same time? We should just discard one and work on one. Pick one as a group, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, Trillis, you, <laughs> you can keep talking. This is, this is evolving into a much larger philosophy. You can keep talking, <laughs> but you may not be able to present at the end, just so you know. You can keep it going, but you're not going to have time at the end, just so you know. So your choice. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> right, no, um, so, so just wanted to say that on the forwarding plane stuff, there was one of the questions to ask about MPLS because I think we could keep the MLDP or RSVP T point to multi point forwarding plane if we wanted to do something like that. But if basically MPLS is completely done and we don't want to, you know, do new control for it, that's, I have no opinion. <laughs> <laughs> all right, very good. All right, so we, there's always room for improvement. Yeah. So, Dave, we need to move on. Yes, um, we, we agreed that we would pull the the list. We will do that on the list. Um, Mike McBride from Huawei speaking. I think that this is exactly why we did recharter this working group some time ago to address protocols for IP multicast. So I think it could should certainly fit within our working group. We may have to talk to Avro about if this working group does feel like it should work on this type of work that we should maybe add that to our charters explicitly, but we can talk about that later. Okay. Any other comments? Well, I would say uh, we should see if the working group is interested or not. If there is interest, we can beg Alvaro if we can do it. But it's really up to us if you're interested in this. So after all my uh, pseudo negative, and this is actually, I thank you for bringing it because this is actually something fresh to talk about uh, at Multicast. <laughs> so I read, but uh, which, which at the end is important. I think uh, we need to have those discussions. What, what I'm trying to say is, guys, we need to have those discussions, but we, we, we should not be creating things for the sake of creating things. And, you know, I am not, I'm not trying to be controversial, but if you want to see how alive or dead is technology, look at the last two years of uh, delivered roadmaps uh, or product extension on major routing vendors, and it will tell you how active or not active certain technology is. Uh, we can be standardizing, you know, the hell out of the, the stuff, but look at the implementations and what they are. The, the right. Well, my, yeah. my closing remark would be that I'm not a masochist. I brought this back because there's a head wound that hasn't <laughs> been filled, and it hasn't been filled since I brought this back, originally brought this forward at IETF 95. So. Thank you, Dave. Charlie. Sure. Minus five minutes now, or? Yeah, be as quick as we can. That doesn't work, I think. Oh, yeah. We'll need to press through. Next slide. Right. Uh, right. Okay, so, um, wait a second. Which 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 stack was the, the reliable? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have two, so sorry. Uh, I didn't know what, in which order. This is reliable. Yeah. Right, okay. So, um, there were no updates since 101, so I just wanted to do slides with a sales pitch why you uh, shouldn't think this is just some strange optimization in the exotic parts at a far off island in PIM world, right? So, but instead, no, it's an important part in the puzzle to update our protocol landscape for the 21st century. Okay, next slide. Right, so what's the strategy? Sorry, these slides are all way too texty, so they're better to read on your own after you had way too many beers. Um, so I think we want the best compromise moving the industry to what we understand to be best working and what's best feasible, right? And our constituencies are, you know, the network operators and evolving to the, be the best has, you know, key third party dependencies. And that's pretty much the problem between ASM and SSM that enterprises can't easily move everything to uh, SSM, right? So there's a lot of stuff where the application dependency says, oh, it should be an SSM application, but I can't do it. And then there are also great BIDER PIM ASM applications, right? So until we basically make any progress, I would claim that, you know, for many vendors, 90% of the money they're making comes from deployments where, you know, ASM with either PIM sparse mode, intradomain, and or BIDER PIM is really crucial. Um, and so uh, we really need to make sure that we have for that option also an evolution long term to say, here's the best protocols we want to use for that. Next slide. So, but one of the big leftovers that we have is MSTP, right? So we're going to get rid of uh, MSTP interdomain inter if we adopt the ongoing call for, you know, uh, the deprecate um, interdomain. Um, ASM in MBOND. So if you weren't aware of that, please go to the MBOND list and say, I support that draft. So that was support that was discussed an hour ago in MBOND. So that will have us get rid of interdomain ASM, but that doesn't uh, allow us yet to completely retire MSDP because it's left over with a really well working solution, which is called the MSDP. Um, 
mesh group within a domain, in, intra-domain, to basically do a, a mesh group um, for, for PMSN. And so now, um, the goal here is to figure out what way can we do to replace MSDP in that role. And we've got RFC 4610, which is the PIM Anycast RP functionality, and it's just missing um, pieces where when I'm talking to customers, I'm always saying, if you want to have IPv4, MSDP in the implementations, in what's been standardized is better, right? It has a MIP model, right? It has um, limiters. It basically got reliability, congestion control, because it uses TCP, yada, yada, yada. So in the end, um, what I think is we want to get RFC 4610 up to that level, which involves two parts of work. One is the Yang model, with which we can do all these operational uh, things like your know, limiters and you know cache entries showing. All this stuff can nicely be op optional. It doesn't have to be part of you know the protocol specs, just you know a local implementation. Uh, part that uh, vendors can put in if they want to do the Yang model. And the other one is reliability TCP. And this is where this draft comes in because this is pretty much just saying we already have reliable PIM over TCP with all the congestion control that we need over you know nasty links that we get more and more with uh, wireless and, and anything else. And of course, you know, WAN links where we have um, the uh, PIM um, register between mesh group members running, they often also are problematic when we have, you know, uh, failovers. So, um, so this draft is pretty much adding a port for the registers. Um, the important case, I think, is the mesh group. It also gives us a port for the DR to RP operations, which is great too, which kind of, to me, is second priority from the strategy perspective. Next slide. Right. So we would like, so this has been around for quite a while, right, this draft. Um, so we would like to ask the PIM working group to adopt this document. Please go read it, what you think, right? We, the, the, the text uh, for the technology has been fairly stable, right? Uh, this is the strategy, right? Um, I don't want to talk about all these things here. I think that's the second slot, which we may run out of. Um, so the main missing part in the text is really only add information about the strategy, which relates to why we're adopting, but not the technology about how it's working. That's pretty much done, I think. Right? Obviously, there will be bugs that we find in the working group review, which is why we want the working group to run it. But that basically would then, in my opinion, then we add the, the Yang model for, for RSC 4610, and then we kill MSDP. Um, I, I think you're scapegoating MSDP. Uh, I, I don't think MSDP is the criminal here. I think MSDP is merely driving the getaway vehicle. The, 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 the real culprit here is ASM. And I think you're blaming MSDP when you should be blaming ASM. And all you're doing is taking the stuff that MSDP did and moving it to other protocols. And I don't think that's, that, that helps. Um, MSDP, you know, I think it's a scapegoat because it was given an impossible task and it does it. It doesn't, and it does it. There is, okay. Uh, so, so where MSDP is bad is interdomain, right? Yes. Um, but it's not because MSDP is a bad protocol, it's because it was given a task right. to do and it did it, but it was, a, it was an impossible task or a not a good sure. task that it should have never been given. Yes. Um, Intra-domain, mm -hmm. what MSDP is doing within a domain for Anycast RP, um, which is typically what it's used for, is just any, connecting your Anycast mm -hmm. RPs together. There's nothing wrong with MSDP, it's perfectly fine. It, 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 none of the things that you that that we associate with not mm -hmm. liking MSDP for, mm -hmm. is it is it uh, abusing in in an intra domain world? And in fact, all you're doing is just making it, RFC forty six ten. All it did was make PIM do what MSDP did. Yes. And now you're saying, well, it's missing a few of the things that MSDP was doing. So let's add all those in there so we can completely get rid of MSDP. I don't think MSDP is the problem renaming protocols doesn't make things simpler moving the same function from one protocol to another because it's a less popular product from a less popular to a more popular protocol doesn't make things better you're just renaming functions so I, I think the the goal of eliminating MSDP 
uh, I, I think is is misguided because it's MSDP isn't the problem. ASM is the problem. We're just you're just scapegoating MSDP. Okay, so um, thank you for pointing out that I may be too offensive, right? So, uh, but um, let's say technically, right? So in the first place, yes, I do think that intra-domain PIM sparse mode with an MSDP mesh uh, group is a very successful deployment model, right? Uh, very well working, and it's basically the best way for an enterprise to basically set up a rock-solid multicast that gives you shortest path trees and everything that you need to, to use for your stupid ASM application. However stupid they are, right, that's basically not the point here. We just have to recognize that we can't have uh, our customers in the enterprise be the victims of the fact that they can't impact their applications, right? So that's basically why I want to have a well-working um, and also good standard track solution and one that doesn't only work for v4, right? Because that's the problem of MSDP, right? So yes, I could obviously go up and uh, do an MSDP version 2, uh, which is basically throwing out all the interdomain stuff, right? And then basically add IPv6 uh, signaling elements to it. And I would uh, get fairly similar. But then, of course, I have basically, you know, some good inconsistency between the port that I have for my um, uh, join and prune messages in PIM, and then this crazy historic uh, message format that I have in my MSDP SA messages. So it's it gets me the same stuff. It's just very inconsistent. And I would want to do a new Yang model anyhow, right? The the IPv4 uh, MSDP uh, MIP only doesn't help me these days anymore. So that's right. why I'm saying it's technically the better alternative. Um, than trying to revive MSDP for IPv6 intra-domain only. Let me just yeah. add that we do have a draft for an MSDP Yang model, and we would like input on that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and and, and uh, in in the case of v6, we determined we don't need MSDP uh, for v6 because MSDP was doing two things: one inter-domain and one intra-domain. Embedded RP gives us inter-domain, and 4610 gives us intra-domain. I guess your point is. It gives us intro domain, but almost not as much. There's some things missing that we want to fix uh, to 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 get 4610 to the level of functionality that the, that the, the embedded is. the embedded RP is just a very IPv6 specific management uh, rule, right? That basically have you when you're doing v4 and v6 come up with totally different things and doesn't give you the same amount of uh, resilience that you get with multiple simultaneously active RPs, which is what the mesh group does, right? So it's still kind of the uh, the best resilient solution that we have for ASM. Well, you still have 4610 for intra-domain anycast RP. No, but I'm saying that solution doesn't give me the reliable TCP connection that basically work well over WAN links when I have failovers and I get this burst of 10,000, um, you know, SAs or, you know, register messages, however I want to call them, right? Mm -hmm. So that's basically just a rock-solid solution and that's something which I think we should have better than with an IPv4 only experimental protocol that we typically bitch about, obviously, as you said, only for the interdomain case. And it's unfair because obviously that was an impossible task. Hmm. Right? Okay. I, so, I mean, I would say I'm not disagreeing with uh, this draft, I'm disagreeing with some of your strategies for this draft uh, because I, I think in, in some cases, the, uh, you're, uh, using this draft as a way to kill or club MSDP. So I, I guess I, I just wonder about the rationale. Well, so let's go back, right? So I think the interesting rationale now is for the important constituency of, you know, enterprises using ASM, what is our preferred um, deployment model intra-domain? I think that's basically the mesh group. Right. So, so yeah, and, and then and we have that with 4610. You're just saying that 4610, we want 4610 with TCP. Is that... Okay. With with and, and and a whole Yang model with all the features I know operationally to be important, okay. but that's independent, right? Obviously. All right. Cool. Got it. I was just hung up on your rationale. Yeah. Ranak? Ranak? Uh, Are we good? I do you want to ask anything about the chat? Yeah. No. It was. We would like to ask the PIM working group to adopt this document. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I'm technically a core first. So oh. Okay. Show your hands if you think that uh, the working group should adopt this working group, this document. I see one hand. Two hands. <laughs> Two hands. Okay, we'll make it official. Uh, who feels that we should not adopt this document? Okay, so there's no hands. Um, we'll take it to the list and we'll go from there. Thank you. Uh, um, yes? Uh, 
I think there, there are some folks who still want an intra-domain ASM, and I think in many cases they're misguided that just about all applications can be done with SSM as well. And so the one thing I would be worried about is do we want to continue pouring resources into ASM when and, help, and uh, providing more and more solutions to keep ASM alive, even in, in the intra-domain case, or do we want to help these people move along to the to the next thing? Let's discuss that more. Great point. Well, we have 20 minutes be, left, Torless. Yes, okay. We gotta we got we gotta move on. Sorry. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, I'm Ronak from Cisco and I'll be presenting this draft for PIM null register packing. So as we know that PIM uses null register mechanism to refresh the multicast states um, at the RP from the first stop router. Uh, for one particular SG, we send one null register today. Uh, if there, the number of states, multicast uh, states increases, if the number of multicast SGs increases, um, we'll have that many number of uh, PIM null register that will be sent uh, periodically from FHR to the RP. Uh, this could potentially cause uh, drops, uh, COP drops uh, at the RP if uh, uh, in, in a large scale scenario. And eventually it can lead to expiries of the SG because the COP will drop the register that are being received at the RP. Um, this problem uh, has arise from a customer issue that we have got and uh, we propose uh, a, a possible solution in the draft. So the draft mainly proposes a method to actually pack all the null registers, um, uh, to pack all the SGs in a single null register. Uh, essentially, um, it could happen that in a network, you can have another um, um, RP, which actually does not understand this message. So we also propose a compatibility checking mechanism by which uh, RP actually can act and say that, okay, I do understand this message, so I'm ready for the PAG null register message. Uh, only when they both support uh, PAG null register messaging, this uh, message will be sent from the first hop router. So essentially the advantage is actually to um, the overall null register um, packets in the network will reduce drastically. Uh, we'll better be able to utilize the control plane in, in case of scale, especially. Uh, also, it is relatively very easy to implement. It uh, um, does not require any uh, special uh, or special writing of the code. Uh, we already walk um, all the uh, routes for the PIM, for clubbing all the PIM joins, prunes in one single message. All we have to do is actually pack the null register and send it to the RP. Uh, this draft was actually um, presented uh, in um, IETF 101. Uh, although we didn't receive any comments, uh, I would like to know if there are any comments or if there are any feedback on it. I uh, would love to know that. Thank you. I actually thought I had two people giving me comments, but one of them walked out and the other one <laughs> went there. Yeah, I mean, if uh, I mean, I would like to have this drop, uh, draft adopted and have discussion on that. Okay, very good. So we'll definitely have a discussion on it. But okay. before we have a discussion on the list, um, in the room, who feels that this is a uh, draft that we should adopt? I see two hands, three hands. Four, I see four. Four hands, okay, I'll trust you on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, who feels that this is a draft we should not uh, adopt? Okay, good for you. That's um, that's a promising. So we'll take that to the list. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. That's pretty good. Next group. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> okay. yeah. 
the next one. So this is another new draft that uh, we propose. Um, so this is for the uh, graceful insertion and removal for a PIM router. Um, so uh, graceful insertion and removal uh, is uh, very widely adopted by network administrator today uh, in place of, in fact, sometimes ISSU or SSD. Um, today, when a multicast router goes through maintenance mode, uh, it leads to traffic disruption. And uh, the goal for this draft is actually to make a GIR graceful uh, so that the multicast router can be actually gracefully um, removed or inserted back into the network so that there is minimal traffic disruption. Um, so this draft primarily discusses various uh, scenarios, requirement, and a possible solution. Uh, we can have more discussion on it later. But uh, the draft essentially has a possible solution for the same. Um, as part of the current um, GIR procedure, uh, we uh, the router who is undergoing GIR uh, will uh, send infinite matrix across all the routers in the network. Uh, this infinite matrix will lead to RPF change on all the routers. Um, so, uh, so, so the multicast flows needs to actually change the RPF to make sure that uh, you know. Uh, they point to the new path and uh, remove the old path. Um, but this RPF change has to be a little graceful um, in the sense that um, PIM should not change the RPF immediately to the new path uh, as soon as it receives the unicast routing change. Uh, PIM should send the join message upstream uh, and uh, try to pull the traffic, uh, but do not send a prune immediately. So the idea is mainly to do uh, make before break here. Um, until the packets arrive on the new path, uh, the, the downstream router will keep on forwarding, uh, accepting the traffic and forwarding the traffic downstream towards the receivers. Um, once the uh, traffic come on the new path, uh, the RPF fail packet uh, to the control plane will indicate that the uh, we have received a flow on the new path. Um, upon which the RPF will be changed from old path, uh, old RPF to new RPF, and this change will be atomic, so it should lead to non-stop forwarding of the multicast traffic. Um, the above method, uh, this particular method um, uh, of doing the graceful RPF change uh, may not be advisable in the normal um, RPF change scenario because it could happen that the old um, old link could uh, uh, could be down due to network failure um, or the link fa uh, failure. Uh, so RPF may take more time, which could increase the convergence time. Uh, therefore, uh, we propose that this uh, uh, make before break model should be followed only for uh, uh, only within the GIR window. Um, for this, uh, the solution that we propose is that um, all the routers in the domain uh, must know that there is some routers who is undergoing um, a GIR. And uh, uh, to achieve this, we actually uh, take use of the PIM uh, flooding uh, messages, uh, which is uh, a PFM. Um, we introduce a new TLV um, in the uh, PFM message. And this is originated from the router who is undergoing GIR. Uh, this message is flooded across all the routers in the PIM domain. And it carries uh, the start and the end time for the GIR period. Um, the, uni the unicast uh, matrix has to be adjusted in such a way that uh, uh, the unicast matrix should come in between the start and the end time. This can be done um, on the GIR router because there will be a particular procedure in which all the routing protocols will go down. And we can make sure that uh, the unicast matrix change uh, is uh, timed in such a way that all the routers receive this unique uh, infinite matrix in between the start and the end period. Um, once uh, all the routers receive this infinite metric, it will uh, try to do the RPF change in a graceful manner, as we had discussed earlier. And uh, this should hopefully lead to no disruption, uh, well, uh, minimal or no uh, disruption in the multicast traffic flow. Uh, the same method can actually be followed for um, the, uh, the graceful insertion of the router. Uh, and uh, uh, same method should follow for both of them. So this is a new draft. Uh, what I would like to uh, know is your comments on it, uh, any feedback, and uh, if this can, if we could take this uh, forward. Uh, Jeffrey from Juniper. 
uh, this make before break um, is has been brought up before. Um, in, in fact, some vendors uh, actually have implemented. I forgot if we implemented it, but uh, um, it it can actually be used in the uh, in a in more general uh, case, not just the, the uh, this uh, insert graceful insertion removal, because uh, if if in a, just a normal topology change, if the old path can still be used, even if it's not the best path anymore, obviously the implementation should be smart enough not to, to tear down immediately. You can still uh, expect to receive the tra traffic on the old path until you uh, receive the uh, traffic on the new path. And then if the old path is completely broken, the interface went down, obviously your implementation should be smart enough to immediately to switch to to, to, the old, uh, to the new pass. So I don't think it needs to be specific to the graceful insertion removal, and I don't think it need the, the signaling to let everybody know. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Jeff. I was about to, to say actually the same, so I agree with Jeffrey on, on the point. So, okay. so what you're saying is that basically uh, we can, in general, uh, we can do um, this uh, make before break model uh, and not specifically to GR. In general, we can do it. The implement the implementation should take care of making sure that if there is a link failure, it should be able to go to the new path um, immediately. Right, and this is all uh, local behavior. It does not need any signaling. It's local behavior. It's, it's local behavior. I believe it works for most of the gear that I've seen. At least in the... Um, uh, yeah. We even killing ourselves to make it uh, not uh, not traffic disrupting even though applications at the end don't care uh, because they buffer enough uh, that we recover and if applications do care then you have a much better mechanisms that this will ever able to achieve because you have a zero packet loss mechanisms then set up for multicast. Um, so, uh, okay, uh, so uh, from what I know of is that all the three OSs, uh, at least in Cisco, we don't have make before break bottle on any of them today. Uh, I would say that going back, to, this kind of reminds me of what we started with uh, the, the uh, DR um, thing. This is yeah, and that's kind of what I, I was mentioning in the DR. I think this is a much better approach than those DR mechanisms. Essentially, you know, uh, make before break. That 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 would solve that problem as well. It's a this is a generic case that solves a lot of uh, as opposed to that being a, a specific use case. I I think this could this could uh, kind of replace the, the DR problem we were discussing earlier. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, you check also with ICE. I mean, uh, as as far as I remember, there were um, at least even published some optimization that's based for MLDP at least, right? I don't remember the PIM side, but basically it's same same issue, right? We we only have five minutes left and still one more presentation. Actually, just, just so two, two things that you may need to take into account. The one is that again the duplicate traffic. The second thing is because this PIM only works by hop by hop. It's a JSON neighbors, not beyond that. And it's a reverse path forwarding in certain scenarios and I, on how you build your topology, you may cause a loop between the routers on, uh, for the signaling part. Uh, yeah, in the draft, actually, we have also mentioned the uh, fact that uh, uh, since PFM message could carry a unicast prefix, all the routers can actually know who that unicast prefix is. So essentially, uh, if, uh, if you have a multicast state already with that prefix, you will only do this thing. Otherwise, you will not do it. Um, as far as uh, the uh, message is concerned, that it goes hop by hop, I think the PFM message is flooded across the uh, PIM domain. Uh, so I think we should be good there, right? Yeah, we need to cut this very okay, quick. Just one. Very quick. So this you really should. This is really just a very short-term MOFRR. You send you you do MOFRR for for, uh, for a very short time, and then you 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 send the prune on the old pass. Okay. Yeah, we need to. Yeah. It, yeah, it's a good discussion. I wish we had more time, but we need to take it to the list. Yeah, sure. So Thank you. One last presentation, uh, Torles. Okay, thanks.
All right, so don't don't move the slide. So this this is a quiz. So who was in M Bondi? Yeah, so you're not allowed to answer. Um, <laughs> so um, I want to build today, you know, a network with the you know most uh, ITF well recognized and standardized uh, protocol for hosts uh, to do multicast. Um, question: What what protocol would that be? No? Okay, next slide. So, there's pretty much only one of all these protocols that has the level of full ITF standard. Not proposed standard, not draft standard, but full standard. And that is RFC 1112, which is specifying IGMP v1. So you don't want IPv6, and you don't want any of the newer protocols if you want to have a full standard. So that's kind of the problem statement, right? So the the way that we have the standard levels of our protocols right now is mostly a sign of you know procrastination on updating them. Um, so uh, and when we brought up the whole discussion of uh, retiring um, interdomain ASM, we basically got into you know operators asking us um, what that means for them um, because they've been happy. Uh, with let's say IGMP v2 forever, they're running it intradomain with Bider PIM or PIM sparse mode. They're scared of IGMP v3 and all of that stuff, right? And many operators seem to think that, um, oh, uh, IGMP v3 that is only SSM, you can't do ASM with it, right? Or no, it breaks um, uh, ASM, right? So I think there is some good education to be done, but I think uh, we should also, and that's something like an informational model which we may want to put into MBOND. But for this working group, I think it's primarily the question of what can we do to adjust the status of the documents that we have to the reality of what actually is um, really the most widely deployed and recommended protocols. And it's certainly not IGMP version one. Next slide. Right, so the whole idea, of course, is this work should not touch ASM, right? So we have all the discussion of uh, retiring it into a domain and what we can basically do with the other drafts to evolve the protocol so we get rid of MSDP um, or, you know, um, basically just have a good standard stuff to do um, the uh, mesh group internally. But let's say this particular work item, let's just uh, focus on how we adjust uh, the status of the best protocols and kind of downgrade the older ones. Next slide. So here is basically the list. The um, the standard stuff is what they currently have, right? So we've got RFC eleven twelve, which is kind of the Bible, you know, uh, the Holy Grail, the <laughs> initial multicast protocol still alive. And so that I think is the biggest issue because that is also the only um, uh, document that we have that is really specifying the ASM service model. And it's only doing it for IPv4. There is no specification in the IETF for the ASM service model for IPv6. But this document is two things. It's the IPv4 ASM service model, and it is the specification of IGMP v1. So I think the best solution would be to really you know, do a ref of it, remove all the IGMP v2 one at IPv6, right, wherever it says something about the protocol, kind of v4, v6. And that's basically the standard for ASM. And it's just saying the service model. You join a group. That's pretty much all it says. Obviously, a bunch of interesting details, but really not try to muck around with it. Just you know, get rid of IGMP v1 so we can continue that as a full internet standard, obviously also for IPv6, and be done with that. So then we've got IGMP v2, proposed standard. Well, OK. So obviously, we want IGMP v3. Um, but what is it and kind of what's the historic process, right? What's our downgrade options? Right, so that's something I want to ask uh, our AD about, um, you know, uh, is historic the typical thing you would do if you want to have a full standard, you don't want people to use it anymore? Could we deprecate it or and do, does, do we need to come up with like make with three being full standard before we do that? Or? Um, a little bit the So we can do whatever you guys want to do. That's the short answer. Uh, what would you recommend? Whatever you guys want to do. Okay. I'm going to recommend. So what I'm going to tell you is this: there's two options, right? The option is to go either uh, obsolete. Now, usually, obsolete means I have a replacement specification for yes. whatever, right? Yes. Um, which is not this, right? That sounds good. The other one is uh, just uh, change the status to historic. Now, the nice thing about that is that we can do a change of status in place. That means we don't have to do a new 
RFC 1112 bis or something okay. to replace the old one. We can just put in a, uh, a, a justification of why we're doing this, mm -hmm. take it to a TF last call, and that's it. Assuming no one opposes to that, right, of mm -hmm. course. Then we can just reclassify any of that as historic. Okay, so what's the difference between obsolete and historic? The most simple process. So basically, you can make something historic without having something better, and obsolete, you must have something better. Pretty much. Okay. Right. So, so in other words, if you're saying, um, uh, yes. So, so in other words, there was a an effort. If you remember last year, we're making IPv4 historic, right? Where IPv6 is another version of IP. It doesn't completely replace v4, right? right? And so the intention there was saying, well, we really don't want to use IPv4 mm -hmm. anymore. Okay. Like you might say, we don't really want to use IGP version 1 anymore. I mean, it's there. We don't really want to replace it. We don't want to update it. We don't want to change it. Mm -hmm. It's there. We're just going to declare it historic because we don't think people should use it or whatever the justification may be. The process can be very simple. It can be just a paragraph that uh, someone writes, and that's it. Or if you guys think there are... Sorry, where does the paragraph go? So the process is there is something called the status change document, which theoretically I write, but that means that you write. Um, okay. Explaining the... Uh, that's one thing I can delegate. The one thing I can delegate. Uh, explaining why we're doing this. So if it's as easy as saying, well, you know, no one really uses IGP version 1 anymore. That's it. You know, that's one paragraph justification. I put a data tracker. It gets uh, last call, and that's it. We have four weeks last call, and we then uh, change that. If the justification is, is bigger, mm -hmm. or if there are exceptions, like we wanted to call ASM historic, but only for these cases, or I don't know, something really weird like that, maybe now we need an actual draft mm -hmm. that gets discussed and processed through the whole process and everything else where it talks about here are the conditions where you really shouldn't use this, here are the ones where you might want to use it, here's you know, blah, 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 you know, whatever. Um, so that process is a little bit more complex. So if, for um, example, the, the most difficult part of the whole scheme, I think, is the 1.1.1.2, full standard for IPv4 ASM. I think the ASM part, we I would love to see kept full internet standard, but not implying, uh, you know, the IGMP we want. So ref the document, remove that part, how much ITF process is needed to give it the, 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 the status? The full process, right? Right. But again, I mean, if, if the only, you know, textual changes are IPv4, IPv6, and you see, you know, it's just the IGMPv1 removed, then is that... Yeah, but we still have, we still have to go through the full sure, process. Fine. Right? And in, so, in terms of, you know, yeah, okay. Correct. So we can't working. make uh, half of that RFC historic, right? Right, exactly. That's why I was saying the, the whole thing, or yes. we don't make anything, or yeah. you know, whatever. Right? Exactly. Right. So that's the main issue. Right. Can I just ask a, a process question? Again? If we make it historic, does it prevent us from doing any changes from now on? Mm. Like, I, is this a word only? <coughs> in which case, like, who cares? Really, almost. Or we actually, you know, this actually has some meaning. So we, let's say, we make it historic, or we have to make it obsolete, and like. Once it's historic, can somebody bring, oh, no, 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 it's not that historic. Now I want to add a bit here an extension or something like this. How uh, does this work? That's a good question. It probably requires more than the okay. negative five minutes that we have. Um, so I think that in theory, because it went through ATF last call, and everyone agreed, not just the working group, yeah. not just you and me, yeah. everyone agreed, it means that we're not doing that anymore. So in theory, yes, no one should come back and say, oh, I forgot this bit. Or I want to really add something because my customer's still using that. So you know, but, but theory, basically that, 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 that seems to me like if I still want to have ASM as a full standard, right, because I think it's valuable intra-domain, at least BIDER, right, I don't see that I ever want that to go away, then I would make the new document, which is just the ASM stuff, um, and then would call the other one um, obsolete, right? Because it's superseded, and the super in, in the superseding, there is basically no IGMP v1 anymore. Right, right. So that's. Right. Mm -hmm. So to finish the answer to Andrew, now if someone and I've never seen this happen, but if someone actually did come in with a bit, right, or whatever that they wanted to um, still work on something that is historic, 
well, first, you guys would have to discuss that, and I'm sure people will get up and say, no, we can't do that because it's historic, and it might not get adopted, it might, might only get one hand up, not the thresholds of two, what is threshold? <laughs> two hands. Uh, by the way, we need to do something about two hands, right? Uh, I have two hands. We can't just, what? Four, one. Oh, yeah, correct. But, but we need to do something about that. I mean, we need more yeah. something uh, in this working group. Yeah, by the way, we have uh, like five minutes so we're time. Yeah, yeah so it's just, just let me finish. So even, even if it, <laughs> yeah, so in any case, uh, yeah, theoretically, if it's historic, no one works on it because there's going to be a lot of people who are going to object. Right, if it's not the working group, it's going to be outside the working group because people are going to say, well, if it's historic, it shouldn't happen. You know, revise the whole ITF process and all that stuff. So that sounds to me like something I would love to get MSDP into, right? Whereas this one kind of is more the obsolete stuff replaced by newer documents. Right. Right. Shall I quickly, you know, just so you see the list? Um, next slide. So obviously, IGMP v3, we want to get to full standard. Um, Stig was explaining already in the dry run on MBONDI that one of the things we may want to need to do is to revisit if there is really crappy stuff that never has been implemented or been used. So I think that seems to be the exclude uh, list of sources that we don't want to get in ASM mode. That is in implementations, I know it, but nobody ever used it in applications. So it's an underutilized feature. We don't know how well it actually works because no application seems to have been doing that. And actually, um, if yeah, the other ones, let's skip. I think it's clear, right? MLD v1 downgrade, MLD v2 is, is the upgrade. Next slide. Um, so I think the interesting one is then this lightweight IGMP v3 and MLD v2. And so basically, that really the only difference is it actually has removed the exclude list. So maybe if we do a ref of IGMP v3 and MLD v2 where we cut out the things that we haven't been using, which is the exclude list, then we kind of supersede both existing IGMP v3, MLD v2 two-fold standard, kind of similar how the latest revision of PIM was done, where also stuff was cut out. And that should also supersede then uh, 5790, right? So that seems to be, to me, reasonably logical and simple, if, if that's a conclusion, right? Yeah, and that's pretty much, yeah. That was pretty much kind of just, you know, on this side, a possible strategy. I think it's great. I think we should we should try to do a very quick change on because half of this list probably there will be zero controversy. Uh, at least half, I would hope. Mm -hmm. uh, what to historic, what not to historic, and do a quick change. And then I think for some of the things, uh, the ASM status has to get fully resolved so we can yeah. clean the rest. Well, I mean, the, the biggest yeah. issue, I, I would have to ask Steve, right? So in terms of, you know, what he would say, he owns the, the Bible, right? So what, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And, and, and then basically the other ones, right? I think it's obsolete for um, IGMP v2, MLD v1, and then trying to figure out, uh, can we simple, do we simply want to upgrade with the process that Alvaro said, IGMP v3, MLD v2 to full standard, or do we want to go the step of removing these, these bits and pieces that we know haven't uh, well been used? So them? just to be clear, uh, real quick, the, the, quick the quick process only works for um, downgrades. Okay. It doesn't work for upgrades. So if okay. you want to go to internet standard, right. you need to go revise the whole RFC, make sure there's no errata. How, how sure did that, RFC you know, 1112 ever get a full internet standard? I have no, no idea. idea. Okay. That was before I was born. I, okay. I don't know. No, but we did yeah. a quick, we All did right. a quick process. Yeah. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Thank you, guys. Well, we're well, done, but you guys can keep going. We did a quick, we did a quick yeah, so beer was different because yeah, beer was different because it was a very recent publication, <laughs> and uh, at the time of publication, everyone agreed that we changed the status. So, so yeah, so, so among other things, we need to make sure. That